So yes, I'm from Oregon State University. Um, we're a land-grant institution, and we have, as it says there, about 28,000 full-time students. We have a fairly large distance learning component as well. And we have our one main campus, which is, I don't know, probably 90% of the students, and two far-flung campuses, one on the coast, one on the other side of the mountains. We initially adopted uh, Canvas in January of 2015, which seems so long ago, but really wasn't. And we were still running Blackboard at that time. So for a full year, we ran both. And as of January of this year, no more Blackboard. Um, we, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's so much easier not running two. And we have over 10,000 courses taught per year in Canvas. Um, that's, that's a lot. It's, you know, 3,300 per term, kind of. We're a, on a quarter system, so we have a summer session, but it's a lot smaller. So before I went any further, I wanted to ask, how many of the, you in the room are admins, Canvas admins? Wow! I didn't know there were that many Canvas admins. So are there any developers in the room? Good. And that's a few, but not too many. Are any of you admins thinking about doing a little developing? Yeah, that's kind of where I am, and that's what got me going on this. So I hope that'll be helpful to you as well. One of the things I noticed in Canvas is they have some really good built-in reports, but they don't have everything I want. Everybody wants something different, so no surprise there. How, who out here has even seen the live API? Pretty good number, but not nearly, it wasn't like a quarter, maybe a quarter. So for some reason, this is not well publicized, and I don't know why that is, but when I ran across it, I was really happy, and I found it very useful. So here's some of the reports they didn't provide that I wish I had. Um, students who've been deleted from a current term course. I don't know if anybody else needs that. But when they're deleted, you have no access to the record of their enrollment readily. And sometimes they need to be brought back. So I needed that. Sometimes I want to know how, what's going on with my SIS import. It's taking too long. What's up with that? And there's no, I get faculty all the time that want to know how to print the course roster. And they can do it from Banner Self Service, or SIS, but they can't do it from Canvas. And grade change log in CSV form was handy to have. And the last one's not a report, but I wanted to be able to add a student to a course without sending an email invitation. So what is the live API? Well, I can read this to you. Uh, it's it's an, an interactive version of the uh, application programming interface. So what it really is, when you look at it, is it's, uh, it has what's called a Swagger interface that just takes the JavaScript code and makes it look pretty. So you've got little boxes where you can put in variable values. For each institution, it's your institution name, name.instructure.com, doc API live. For example, well, yeah, there's ours, Oregon State.instructure.com, blah, blah, blah. You also have a test instance of this. So if you want to play with your test instance instead, you just put the test in there. So it's Oregon State.test.instructure.com, doc API live. Everybody has it. Now, this is uh, one of the limitations, is you have to use the internal IDs to get data out of the live API. For example, you need the course ID that shows up on the URL when you go to a course. You can't use the course that your SIS calls it, course name. And for the, um, you need your account ID, which you may not have ever noticed, but it's in the URL every time you go into Canvas at all. And you need the user ID. Again, that's the internal Canvas ID that gets generated when a new user is created in Canvas. So it's not a number that you've assigned to this user, so you have to look it up. Everybody got that picture taken? <laughs> so the first thing you have to do is you have to get an access token. I don't know if you know what that is. It's basically both your username and your passport, uh, password all rolled into one. 
So never let anybody else use it. If they do, they're behaving as you. All of their actions are under your user ID. So just don't do that. So you go into account settings, your account, not the account for the school. It's personal account settings. You go down to new access tokens. It's near the bottom below the approved integrations. I'm going to show you screenshots of this. You get, click to get a new access token. You generate it. And then you have to record it. <laughs> this really is your only chance. If you don't record it in the pop-up screen, it's gone and go generate a new one because there's no way to get it back. And there you go. You can delete it and generate a new one anytime you need to. So here are the screenshots for what that looks like. So you click on, I could use the pointer if I could figure out how. Oh, well, you can see it. So you click on account and settings. Good thing I circled those things. And you scroll down. It's not that far. You can see that's the top of my settings. I don't have a lot of extra stuff. The blue arrow indicates I skipped some stuff that was in between. And you just say new access token. And then the purpose, just fill in whatever you want. When you go look at access tokens, you're going to find you have other access tokens in there. And you just want to name this in some way that you'll know which one it is. So you'll know which one you're using. I never give it an expiration date because I frequently throw it away and generate a new one just for whatever reason so it doesn't get, uh, I don't know. I forget what it is. I lose the file. And this is what it looks like. So the token is that number at the top. Copy it down. It says that right there. That's the thing that if you don't copy it now, you don't get it again. The regenerate token does not mean regenerate this token. It means start over. So that's what you're going to record. I just put it in a file, and then I've always got it when I need it. So then you go to the live API. Now, this is going to that URL that I mentioned before, yourinstitution.instructor.com doc API live, and this is what it looks like. You can actually see the URL. Doesn't say exactly that, but it's, I'm in the test instance, so it's Oregon State Test Instructor com doc API, and that would say live if I was putting that in the URL, and you drop that token in there, and you save the token. And then you can do stuff. Even if you don't do that, you can browse around in here. And other users who are not admins and don't have tokens can browse around in here and get some idea of what the APIs do. And I have other users who've done that to just get an idea of what's possible. They can't get data out with them, but they can go look at it. So, but we, as admins, are going to put in that access token and save it. And now I'll show you a couple of examples of what we can do with that. So we're going to find deleted enrollments in a course. Our enrollments are all created by, uh, automatically by import from the SIS, which is Banner in our case. When a student withdraws or drops from a course, they get the deleted status, so as I said before, you don't have any information about them anymore. You can't look at a course and say, here are the students who dropped it. We get requests, not infrequently, from faculty, sometimes financial aid, and they need to know when was the last time the student was active in the course. They don't need to know what date they dropped it. They need to know when they last participated. So the only thing we can do is re-enable the enrollment, but we don't know what it is. So here's how to find that out. So this is what the, API, the live API looks like. Above and below, so it says enrollment terms, enrollments, and then down below, error reports, external tools, blah, blah, blah. Those are all various things you can look at. For enrollments, I've clicked on list, and that expands and shows you, for enrollments, what types of things you can do. I'm going to focus on the get actions first. So we're going to use the first one, enrollments by course ID. It's also really useful to do it by user ID. So if somebody says to me, uh, Joe Smith was in my art class, and I need to know what date he was last active. Well, they don't know exactly what the course ID is or something like that. 
So I can use the user ID, the third one down, and just say, look up Joe Smith, look up all of his deleted enrollments, and you know which one was an art class. But we're going to start with the by course one at the top. So the green circled thing, list enrollments, you click on that, and it, expa it expands even further. It gives you a lot of data on what, what the possibilities are here. Maybe too much. <laughs> I'm not even going to show you everything. But it does give you the full explanation of what this API does. So you know what, for example, what is the ID? What do they mean by that? Uh, course ID, you're going to know what that is. But it gives a whole, I'm not even going to show you all of it. On the next screen, I'm going to be scrolled way down to where the action is. So this goes back to where I mentioned you have to use the, did I mention that? Did I talk about having to get the, yeah, I did. <laughs> So you need to get the course ID. That's when you go to a course, so you search through courses by maybe their names, maybe it's chemistry 232, and you go there, and in the URL, it has that course ID. You know, it says Oregon State, instructor.com, courses, and then an ID number. And you know, we tell instructors all the time, get that number, you need that here. And that's really all you need other than the state. And in this case, I'm getting deleted, but you can see in the explanation that there, you can maybe want to get all the people who've been invited, and their state is still invited. They haven't accepted it yet. Maybe, you know, you want to know, I've got five people who are invited. Maybe I need to resend that invitation. But we're going to look at deleted. So I click, oh, wait, go back. <laughs> so you just put in those two pieces of information, you could clarify further. You could put in a role, but the course ID and the state are the only two required ones, and those are in bold. The required elements are always in bold. And then down here at the little red arrow, you click on Try It Out. And that's what you get. See, there's the Try It Out button. Down below, you get what's called the response body. Well, that's nice. <laughs> What are you going to do with that? It's not particularly readable. So what do you do? That's what's called JSON format. And like I said, not very readable. I mean, you could see, you could kind of look through it and get some information. But maybe there's a way to look at it in a more human readable way. So what you do is you copy the entire response body, and you paste that into a JSON converter. And I have two that I use all the time, um, jsonviewer.stack.hu. That just takes an, it's not super useful in this case. I'll show it, you a case where that's more useful later. But the one I use all the time is convert JSON to CSV. So it's going to take that slightly formatted long thing, and it's going to convert it into a spreadsheet. And that's what that looks like. So you took the entire response body, and you can see by the scroll bar, there's a whole lot more stuff in there. And down at the bottom is the, response, is the, the formatting that you get. You can see that there were 10 total, and you can download the entire CSV. So you have this in a CSV file, and you can do whatever you want with it. You can put it in an Excel spreadsheet, and, you know, or you can just ship it off to the instructor or whoever asked for it. One of the things I like to do when I'm not parched, is I'm an old Unix person, so I just like to put it in a flat file and use tools like sed and awk to strip out all the fields I don't care about. Because, you know, there's, I don't really care about the created at. Updated at, maybe. But, you know, course section ID, not something I need. They don't need the root account ID. So I just get just the fields I need. But some of you are probably really talented at Excel, and you can do it in Excel and just, yeah, exactly. But you may have noticed that I had 10, um, it had 10 results. 
how do we know that that's all the results there were? What if there are more than 10 results? There actually were more than 10 results. <laughs> and the problem is, in this interface, this isn't meant to replace programming. This isn't meant to replace other more sophisticated tools. This is just to let you see how the API works. So what if you needed to do a little bit more for you? You can take the request URL, which is between the try it out button and the res response body that we were just looking at, and you can paste that into a UR paste the URL into a browser and add ampersand per page equals 100. Now you're going to get up to 100 results. But it looks like this. <laughs> because now it's in a URL. So now you've lost all the formatting. At least when it was in the response body, it was kind of neat looking. You could read it a little bit. This has the same information, but it's completely unreadable by humans. But, and that is the URL that we pasted in, you can see ampersand per page 100. One tip on this is when you go to paste this into a JSON formatter, leave out the while one. Just take everything below that. So now we're going to put this in that same JSON converter, because this is going to be a lot of results. Now we've got 55. But I asked for up to 100, so I'm sure 55 is all of them. And again, it's the same data. You've got 55 of them. You only see the first few. So you know the, view, the JSON converter isn't there to, again, replace some more sophisticated program. But you just download the CSV and do what you need to do with it. So are there any questions on this first example? Yes. So, right, so the question is, am I at all concerned about putting this data that has real student data on what's basically a public website, this JSON converter? And maybe I should be. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I suppose there could be somebody who was that slick that they would think to, you know, sort of watch these JSON converters just in case there was any, and I hope, uh, the people in the room from my institution don't tell on me. I don't know any other way to do this. I'm not going to write my own JSON converter. So I don't know, Lynn, don't tell anybody. <laughs> but any other questions? Oh, here's one back here. I can't quite hear you. I can hear most of that, but not all of it. Does, is there a microphone in the room? No. What provisions of control are on this so that the, the instructor or, or someone or support advocate would go in there and create a code and do it? So the question is, what controls or permissions are there that prevent, say, an instructor or some other administrative person who doesn't have admin powers from just going and, and finding out that this tool exists and get this kind of data themselves. Well, sort of fortunately, but also unfortunately, you have to be an admin to do it. To get the access token, <laughs> yes? But they can't. It didn't sound like the microphone was working there, so I'll repeat that. Even if you ac uh, generate your own access token, your permissions are limited to what you have permission to do within Canvas anyway. So if you're an instructor, I've actually tried this as an instructor, and I couldn't get anywhere with it. Uh, you know, I was masquerading as an instructor, and I basically couldn't get anything out of the live API. But even if you could, if there's some way to do that that I haven't figured out yet, Maybe masquerading just was the hitch in my get-along, but 
again, your permissions are still going to be restricted to whatever your permissions are in Canvas. So if an instructor found a way to do that, well, they could look at their own courses. So I don't think that should be a problem. Anybody else? Yes, in the blue shirt. So the, the question or statement was that in the regular Canvas API, you can replace the internal course ID with, say, the SIS course ID, and wouldn't there be a way to do that in here? And there may be a way to reconstruct the URL that I just haven't tried yet, but I'm actually going to touch on that a little bit later. So anybody else? If I don't see you, please stand up, because <laughs> that's a very bright light. Okay, good. So I'll go on to another example then. So checking your SIS imports. We don't have that much trouble with SIS imports anymore, but a year ago, sometimes they took incredibly long and we weren't sure what was going on and how far the progress was. And you could look at that, you could go to the SIS import page and it shows you what the current running one is doing, but you don't know is what the previous one, or you can never look back, it's only the most recent one. So this is a handy way to look at what has happened in the past. Now, you can limit it to certain dates, which makes a lot of sense because do you really care what happened a year ago? No, you probably don't. So I didn't bother to do that and was surprised that even when I didn't limit it to certain dates, it didn't take very long. So this is, in each of these um, screenshots, it does show like there's quizzes, there's roles, there's SI import, imports, SIS integration, and I'm not sure what search does. Oh, oh, that's this, yeah, I don't know what that does. Anyway, but this is SIS imports, and I click the list, and it does that expansion, which shows us there's three different functions we have. And then this is cut to um, listing the first one, get SIS imports by account ID. That's just dotted line, this is different. So all you need here is the account ID, which you know, it's in your URL. And the, again, the created since, you can say created since yesterday or something like that. I didn't bother. And try it out. And here's the response I got. The main thing I was interested, it, it, this is kind of a boring example because I didn't have any problems to show you. But you can, it, the workflow state could say in progress, it could say completed, which is uh, one step before imported. It's like it gets completed and then it does some notifications and it becomes imported. But that's what that looks like if you need to find out what's going on with SIS imports. I didn't know any other way to get that information. Any questions on that one? That's a quick one. And this is one, I don't know if other people care about this, but I did. I wanted to enroll a user in the course and you know, I know I can go in the course, I can click plus people. And that sends them an invitation, which is just not a paradigm that our students see. Because all of our enrollments are, are done by SIS import, and they, if you say and then look for an Im invitation in, the, in your email, they're like, what? I, we never get course invitations. So I just wanted to be able to do this. Yeah, I could also construct a CSV file. And sometimes I do that, but this was more fun. <laughs> I mean, and it gave me a way to, to show you an example of using a post API. Up to now, we've been just using get APIs where you're just extracting data out of Canvas. This is actually gonna change something. So this is the enrollments API. And I went down to the post and I put in the course ID and the this is a little bit confusing. It says enrollment bracket user ID. What they want is the student's internal Canvas user ID. Well, that's what it says, the idea of the user to be enrolled. Not that confusing. So you just do that, and I guess I don't have my, oh yeah, and the enrollment type. I don't know what, that doesn't show as required. I don't know what would happen if you didn't choose one, but I wanted them to be a student. You can also do TA or instructor or teacher. And here's the response body. Now here you just want anything that doesn't look like failure. 
I mean, if it says like response type 400, well, try again. You did something wrong. But this shows the course and the student, and they're, and I always go check, but they're always there. It works every time. So any questions on the, using the post API? We're rolling. Okay, there are limitations. Like I said, it's really only usable by people with an admin role. I mean, maybe there's some little things you could do, but basically you're gonna run into so many permissions roadblocks that you really pretty much need to be the admin. I showed you doing that per page equals 100 to get more responses. I only know how to get up to 100. If you make that number bigger, you don't get more. I think this is a pagination issue, and I think if I had a way to look at the second page of results, I'd get more, but I don't know how to do that. So if any of you daring people go out and play around with this and figure that one out, I would love to know how you did it, because I hear someone speaking, I don't see, oh. So you think I can just on, oh, he was making comment in the real Canvas API, there are um, instructions for how to get subsequent pages, and I've actually seen that using real programming API, but maybe there's a way to use that construct on the command, not command line, on the URL to actually say, maybe you can say question mark page equals two, with, so you could have, I should try that. That's a very good suggestion. So you would have the same whole URL with the ampersand per page equals 100, and maybe you can tack on something like question mark page equals two, maybe. So I'll look at the, uh, the actual REST API documentation to see what the syntax is for that. That might work. Anybody else on that? Oh, okay. And there's no way to look up those IDs I was describing in the live API itself. Like, you can't say, okay, well, but I don't wanna have to go to the course to get the course number. Just let me use the API to look that up. Nope, <laughs> that's not there. Or user IDs or, or any of that. And I wish there was a way to just count things. Like, I can't see that, but 10 minutes, thank you. <laughs> Great. Um, <laughs> But like, we have a lot of sub counts. It'd be fun to be able to actually count them. They get generated automatically, and I don't know how many I have now. I could have 145 now, probably more than that. I think I've had that many last time I looked. But basically, no way to just count things. Um, maybe I have time to skip this one and come back to it. But here's a couple, somebody asked about one of these, and here's a couple of little tips and tricks. You can, you can get to a course page without searching by using the course ID. What am I talking about? Oh yeah, so, so this actually will let you use, instead of, instead of using the course number, you can plug in by saying, so normally it would be your, inst your institution, blah, 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 courses, and then that number, 159-7682. But you can actually say, you can put in this variable and say, but I want to search by SIS course ID. And in our case, for example, it would be something like CH underscore 232 underscore 001 S2016. So I could actually go straight to the course page without knowing that number. So I don't know, I liked having that. But I like this user one even better. Nobody really asked the question, how do I get a user's profile? But it includes their Canvas ID. And you can do that by using the SIS user ID. What that is at our school is the student's official student ID number. And that's everywhere. I mean, we see it's on our ID cards. It's uh, a, a number that's commonly known. It's not a private number, it's a public number. And if you know that, you can find the student without going in and searching for users. You can use the user search for that too, but by just saying blah, 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 SIS user ID and that number. Or you can do the login name by saying SIS login ID 
and at our institution, our login name is like I'm Foster L at OregonState.edu, and I can plug that in, and this is what I get. Okay, let's use a formatter. That's the JSON. So I'm gonna take that and use the other JSON formatter I mentioned. That's this one. And you just take and you paste all that hard to read stuff, you click on format, and then it looks like what the live API returns to you. So that's a lot more readable. And you know, I don't need anything too fancy. I don't need a CSV for this one. I want that ID number at the top. So then I have that ID number I was looking for. Okay, let's go back to the question screen. So here's all the links to the things I've mentioned. That's where your live API is. Those are the two converters I use. And what he was mentioning before, here's the complete documentation on the whole API. So you can get a lot more detail, and hopefully I can get more detail on some of those, those parameters I can plug on the end of the URL. And that's there, and that's my contact information. So, do I have any more questions? Right here. The question was, I see you can do get and post. Can you do put and delete? You know, I don't remember seeing delete, but there's definitely put. I haven't used put for anything, and I don't actually know what the distinction is between put and post. But it, I know, I bet there's delete in there. I just haven't noticed. Yes? Yeah. And I, like I said, I don't know if there's delete. I know for sure there is put. <laughs> so whoever has the uh, right ability, like a post, they, can, they will have the same ability like a put and delete too. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, anybody back there that I can't see? Right here in the orange shirt. Oh, good, a microphone. Uh, you like Unix, so there's node tools. I like, can't hear you. Is that thing on? You like Unix, so there's node tools. You can convert uh, JSON to CSV and JSON to HTML on a Unix system or Windows. I'm or sorry. I can't hear you. Can anybody else? <laughs> yeah, just yell it out. Stand there's up. Talk loud. He's saying that there's node tools that you can use for your conversion. I don't know of any. But it would, it, that'd be a nice thing to have. If anybody knows of any, I'd love to hear about it. Because it, it probably would be better not to put those out on a public server. You know, chances are slim, but slim's probably not good enough. Hmm? There's HTML code out there. If you have a, there's HTML code and you put a JavaScript file. Just, if you Google convert JSON to okay. uh, CSV, mm -hmm. you can do it on your, just oh, with some code. And Sublime, Sublime Text 2, you can also do that if you okay. configure Okay, and that would do the, the basic JSON formatting? Yeah, you need a plug-in for Sublime Text, but it'll do it. Okay. Great, thank you. And somebody on Twitter recommended a Chrome plugin. Oh, cool. So somebody on Twitter has mentioned a Chrome plugin for doing this. So yay, people are... Okay. Um, unless there are other questions, I'm actually done. And you get five minutes back. Thank you.